Ransomware explained. What is ransomware? How ransomware works and what to do to protect yourself. That's what we're here to discuss. This topic is of such great interest that John Oliver discussed ransomware on last week tonight a number of months ago. Make sure you stick around to the end when our expert, retired FBI agent Vic Hartman, addresses whether or not you should pay ransom when you are hit. Okay, can you start off, Vic, with a simple example of ransomware? Sure, and it's happening all across the U.S. It's happening all across the world. I'll just kind of tell you one industry and give you that example. The healthcare industry is particularly vulnerable and they're being hit for a variety of reasons. And the way you know is when an administrator or somebody turns on their computer one morning and you see a banner across your screen and it says, warning, there's different banners, but basically you're under attack. We've encrypted your data and we want you to pay in some type of ransomware, generally cryptocurrency, and that's how it presents itself. The administrators quickly learn their data is in fact encrypted and they can't get access to it. And now it's shutting down, in this case, the hospital system, and it can create lots of problems of shutting down equipment, access to patient data, could stop surgeries, could stop just the whole functioning of a hospital. So that's a very common example. Okay. And a scary example also. Yes. Yeah. In fact, I think there was a TV show about a hospital that, that, that got hit with ransomware. All right. But I digress. Do you have a simple definition of ransomware that you could provide the audience? Yeah, just a practical definition. It's it's malicious software or malware that's introduced to somebody's computer that encrypts their data, and then the bad actor requests ransom for the key to release the data. That's okay. just kind of a functioning definition. You know, I'm curious, as I was listening to you, it occurred to me, it seems that most of the ransomware attacks that I've read about, and, I'm, and I am not an expert on this, it happens once, and then they don't seem to come back and come back again, as in traditional blackmail. That's generally the case. That's been what I've noticed as well, and I'm in touch with my former FBI colleagues about this. Now, there's different iterations, so that's the general of the case. Sometimes they ask for a ransom and then won't release the data and then ask for a greater ransom. No. So it varies, but you don't always get your data released. Okay. It creates some risk. If you're communicating with the GAM, they release your data. It actually exposes them a little bit for law enforcement. It doesn't necessarily release your data, and they may ask, again, for even a higher ransom. Great. Great. All righty. Hey, guys. I'm Mary Schaefer, founder of AP Now, the place where we share the latest business intelligence with those who work in, manage, or have responsibility for the AP, P2P, and payment functions. And I'd like to give my distinguished guest a chance to tell you a little bit about himself, what he does. And of course, I see your book in the background, Vic. I hope you'll tell our people a little bit about that. Sure. Thanks, Mary. I'm a firm in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm an attorney and CPA, and my firm specializes in forensic accounting, internal investigations, and fraud mitigation consulting. And I also teach at a couple of different universities where I teach a master's level forensic accounting. And thank you for allowing me to promote my book. Good. I just wrote about fraud. Okay. <laughs> Um, and I use this as a text in the classroom. And it's also just, so somebody who just in a company maybe recently inherited fraud risk, it'll give you a soup to nut on everything. You can, every fraud is manageable. It lays out the fraud threat picture and then best practices on how to mitigate fraud. So I use it in fraud workshops as well. Okay. So one of the things that occurred to me as we were talking is we do seem to hear more about fraud in the news. I don't know because the stories are so interesting, but do you think there's more fraud today than there was in the past or no? Um, I think human nature hasn't changed. Publicity has gotten better. Right. The fraud has changed in terms of the types it is. So now there's a lot more cyber fraud. We're talking about ransomware because it's happening. Mm -hmm. Business email compromise. So the fraud threat picture is migrating. We're dealing less in paper currency and more in digital currency. So I don't know if it's gotten the amount of fraud is greater or less. The Association of Certified Fraud Examiners says about 5% of top line revenue is victimized as a company. And that's numbers kind of stayed this constant for the last 10 or 20 years. So I don't know that if it's worse, maybe there's more publicity about it, but the types and the vectors what we're seeing, the threats are changing. Okay. So now I know you often discuss fraud in terms of a life cycle approach. Can you do that with ransomware for our audience? Yes. So the fraud life cycle approach, 
and you can take this with any frauds, but I like to break it down from the victim's perspective and the bad actor's perspective. And we can look at a holistic approach or a, a comprehensive way of looking at it. And we can do this with ransomware. So the first piece is prevention. And prevention may be a bad term, maybe deterrence is better because we can't prevent all frauds. So let's try to work on the prevention piece. And with ransomware, this type of fraud, this is maybe the most important aspect of the fraud life cycle is, is prevention. And, and there's really two types of ways we look at prevention. And that's from a soft control perspective and then a hard control perspective. But the soft control is most ransomwares and business email compromises, they happen because of social engineering. So that's the soft control, a soft skill. Somebody's going to gain the trust of somebody in a company and cause them to make a bad click and they're going to download the malware and then it's happening. So the way to pr prevent that is awareness around social engineering. And that's probably the most effective way that companies can prevent ransomware and business email compromise is through socializing social engineering schemes. So that's the so soft soft controls, but the hard controls are just as important. Back up your data. So if you do get hit, if you have redundancy, back it up in the cloud and on site, encrypt in resonance and in transit. And then if you get hit with ransomware, that's bad, but you can now wipe your system and reinstall your data. You're safe from that perspective. Uh, firewalls, ingress and egress. So if you have a robust firewalls, it will detect this malware coming in or your data going out and that should trip the system. And that may be one way. Software updates, all the major companies, as soon as there's a ransomware attack, they're learning what it is and they're putting updates to, to plug those holes uh, in the software. Virtual private networks, VPNs, customer employees are currently during the pandemic and now just out of practice, increasingly working from home. So virtual private networks are just becoming more important and robust and that those should be in place for remote workers. Intrusion detection software so that when it is happening real time, it'll pick up on this. And then if you're really concerned about this, penetration testing, intrusion testing, where you can have an outside company just check for your social, your soft skills to see if your employees are the weak link and then get past them, or make sure you have a robust, the hard controls, the software and firewalls in place. And then another prevention best practice is have a plan. This should not, when it, if it happens to you, this shouldn't be the first time you've thought about it. So have a plan. There's good plans out there. Every company's unique. So make it structured to your particular situation, but ha have a plan. So you know who to call and what to do as soon as it happens. And then have a table talk exercise as well. So that you exercise it when it's happening real time and it will cause you to think through all these issues. And now you can act a lot more effectively. So that's the prevention piece on the fraud life cycle. Prevention, we can't prevent all frauds. So how are we going to detect it? Ransomware is just like any other fraud. Let's have something in place. Software may be detecting it, or you may detect it when that banner comes up on your screen and says, You've been, we've got you. Your data is now encrypted. So that's not the way you want to learn the detection. <laughs> then we move to the third component, which is investigation. Now we got to look at it. This is where hopefully you've had your robust plan in place. And so you have your professionals on speed dial, you have a forensic team that can come in there and start working with you. And part of your team should be an attorney who's knowledgeable in these areas. And the reason is if you're a regulated entity and like the hospital system and publicly traded company, many regulated industries, there's a difference between a security incident and a breach. And these are legal terms. So if it's a security incident, uh, and you're a regulated entity, you have a duty to mitigate and respond to it. If, if it's a breach, this means the bad actor has gained control of your data, then you have an affirmative duty now to notify. And unfortunately, Congress hasn't uh, fixed the statutory scheme, but it will vary by state and they'll vary under federal law of your duty to notify, and it will depend on the regulated entity and the number of potential victims. And your notification may be noted by the victims, noted by your stakeholders, or put out a press release that it will vary. So that's why this uh, you want part of your your team, your sense that response team to be an attorney to make that call. Is it a security incident or is it a breach? And that's a legal determination. Um, so that's that's the investigation piece. Then we move over in the fraud life cycle to mitigation. And mitigation, depending on the size of your organization, 
you've got a lot of harm done. You've got harm to employees, vendors, customers, stakeholders, reputational risk. So we want to start mitigating that, getting our data back in place and acting real time with all these different issues that are gonna be facing you, which is again, importance of the plan so you can work through these issues in advance. And then the last piece of the fraud life cycle is remediation. Try to make the victim whole. In some frauds, you can sue the bad actor, you might prosecute them. Increasingly, that's very difficult with, with ransomware because the bad actors often in the former Russian Republic in Ukraine or in China, and it's hard to get at them. But part of the remediation may be insurance. So if you have a, the correct policy, then you're going to file that claim. Um, you're going to have to spend some time correctly making sure your, your policy is triggered. So that's the holistic approach, the, the fraud life cycle approach that can um, touch each piece of uh, handling a ransomware attack before in the beginning all the way through to the to litigation results in that. So I was not aware of the notify, um, and I'm, I'm guessing that many of our listeners weren't. So, so much for sweeping it under the rug and hoping nobody will notice if there was an actual breach. Um, I guess you have uh, regulatory responsibilities. Yes. You know, take the hospital example, HIPAA. Right. You may have a HIPAA violation uh, because right. bad actors got control of your data. You, you triggered another thought. Part of your incident response team, should you notify law enforcement? Almost always. You know, some, with some frauds, there's some downsides to not, notifying law enforcement. Not in this case. You should notify the FBI. And the concern is you're afraid that, hey, we've already been victimized by the attack. We don't want the FBI publicizing what happened. Right. The FBI and the Department of Justice is very aware and attuned to this issue. Um, so they don't, they won't go out and hold a press conference and say you've been the victim of a case. Now, there's some exceptions to that. If there's a prosecution, it you know, it'll be, there'll be a press release and it'll be in the media potentially. Right. So you, you, but it's going to probably happen anyways. But the FBI is, they have a response team now in all the field divisions that can help you, can help you find the bad actor, can advise different aspects of this um, and help get your data back potentially. And, and so you should definitely notified the FBI and law enforcement. They probably have more experience dealing with this than you do. There's nobody has more experience than the FBI and Homeland Security with this. I mean, it's their many personnel's full-time responsibility is handling this. They're on the tip of the spear. They know the, all the latest patterns and practices. And if you're a victim, this is probably the first time it's happened to you and you know very little, call in the experts and they're free. Okay. So before we discuss what you should do if you're hit with a ransomware attack, um, if you like this episode, please give us a thumbs up. And if you love it, please subscribe. We produce new content for the channel three times a week. Tuesdays and Thursdays are devoted to payments and accounts payable issues, and Saturdays are reserved for Wordle. Okay, so um, Vic, it would be kind of hard to talk about ransomware and not talk about cryptocurrencies. Um, can you talk about the role that cryptocurrency plays in this landscape and how it's changing? Sure. Um, almost without exception, when the ransomware attack occurs, you'll see this banner across your, your screen and it will start to explain what's happening to you. Your data has been encrypted and they assert, they, they, they advise that they'll release your data with the key, but you got to pay the ransom. That ransom is usually in cryptocurrency. And the reason being is it's somewhat secret and difficult to trace. And I say somewhat because law enforcement is proving that um, it's not without, it's, it's not untraceable as the bad actors think. And there's a lot of cases now where they're tracing it, finding the bad actors, recouping the funds and having prosecutions. The most common cryptocurrency that everyone knows about it's Bitcoin, and that's a common one that that the, the bad actors ask for the ransom in Bitware, Bitcoin. And just as an aside, the Bitcoin, the cryptocurrency in general, the whole market has just been cut in half. If you've mm -hmm. noticed this here recently, um, Bitcoin was got to a high maybe sixty five thousand of Bitcoin, and now I think today it's close to twenty thousand. And this has all happened in the last most of that downfall has happened in the last couple of months. Um, I don't know if that's going to impact the payment of ransomware. Um, it just, you know, if, if the bad actors want to get their money out quickly when, 
when they get the cryptocurrency. Right. But they often pay in um, Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin is traceable. It's a it's, it uses the blockchain technology, and if you have the right software, you can trace every transaction on Bitcoin. That's just this nature of it. There's a misconception that you can't trace a Bitcoin transaction. You can absolutely trace every. It's completely public, and you can trace it all. Now, the wallet is somewhat private. Right. So there are techniques that the now the bad actor has got to launder that Bitcoin and they use something called tumblers or blenders where they mix it with other Bitcoins and that's one way to diffuse it. Um, and then take it just like any traditional money laundering, you make it through a variety of transactions and try to obscure the, the trail. So, but Bitcoin is a, on a public uh, ledger. There are privacy coins, Monero, um, Zcash, Dash, uh, there's others. And these are, they're legible, their ledger is non-traceable. Now, law enforcement's making some good inroads into this issue, whether it's traceable or not. But current best practices is believe that those cryptocurrencies, privacy coins, are non-traceable. So you may be extorted in a non-traceable currency in order to add another layer of protection for the bad actor. But regardless of which coin they're using, uh, it's probably going to be cryptocurrency. Okay. So the IRS is also taking a great interest in uh, cryptocurrency because as much as uh, the holders, creators, whatever you want to call it, of cryptocurrency would like to believe it's not taxable, the IRS is taking a little different look, not surprisingly. Yes. And, and so from a tax perspective, cryptocurrencies are considered a capital asset, not, not, not a currency. And the importance of that is every time you engage in a transaction, it's a capital asset transaction, which means it's a taxable event. For that reason alone, I thought that these cryptocurrencies were going to not be, not being, might make practical sense to business because, you know, if I give you a dollar and the dollar dropped in value today, it's not a taxable event for you. But when you, if I give you a Bitcoin and it dropped or increased in value and you're a target or Sears or Publix, it's a taxable event. And right. so that's a whole nother layer of accounting that's going to complicate um, transactions. Not only that, if you pay me, regardless of how you pay me, I have to pay income tax on that. Yes. According, well, according to the IRS anyway. Well, so there's two taxes. There'll be an income tax and now there's going to be a capital if it increased in value. Now, you might take a loss because it's going down. Right. Um, but it, but it's, it's a taxable event and it's an accounting nightmare if you're doing business routinely yeah. in cryptocurrency. So now, Vic, the million dollar question, should you pay the ransom? Hmm. That is a million dollar question. Um, so let me start at the 30,000 foot view. Okay. Um, and, the, and the US government's view and certainly the FBI's view is you should never pay a ransom, don't pay because, and it's a, it's a public policy perspective. And that is if you pay the ransom, it's just to encourage, encourage more bad acts. And we're gonna have right. more more ransomware, not less. So don't don't pay the ransom. Okay, that's good for the U.S. government to say that. It's a good FBI policy. It's good policy for us as American citizens. The one person that may not be good for is if you're the victim. Now you have to sit in with your victim hat on. And anytime there's a ransomware attack, there should be an escalation protocol that this attack goes right up to the board. Right, right. It, it's in charge of governance, and now it becomes a governance decision, and that's another reason why you should have a, a a plan in place. So this is not the first time you're thinking about it. Right. This you don't okay. want to think about it when you're under pressure. No. You're under pressure. You're a hospital system. You can't get access to data. A surgeon's trying to have surgery. You're trying to make a decision on whether to pay the ransom, get your data back. You got to gather up 12 board members. That's all over the world. That's just not the time to be thinking about this important issue. Um, so should you pay it? Well, and, and, and I'm just going to give the hospital example because it's the most egregious situation where right. you can have patient care issues and through no fault of the patients, uh, they can have patient care issues, life or death. And so now it becomes very real that while you want to generally not pay the ransom because it's bad public policy, you have other considerations to, to, uh, to consider. Let me throw in another wrinkle that really complicates the equation. And that is if you pay ransom 
to somebody who's on the OFAC, the Office of Foreign Asset Control. Oh, gee. Say, I didn't even think about that. <laughs> and, and think uh, Iran, Cuba, Syria, North Korea. Russia. Russia. Not Russia's not on this particular list of people you couldn't pay, um, but uh, it may, may be in the near future. But it's strict liability, which means so you pay North Korea. And it's very possible that a ransom could be coming from North Korea or Syria. And you pay it, it's strict liability, which means you don't have to know. And there's there are big fines and penalties associated with this. Mm -hmm. So you could pay the ransom, you're already victim once, and now you can be victimized again when the US government files action against you for paying someone on the OFAC list. So that's just another complicating wrinkle. To pay or not to pay, it's it's an individual decision. You won't necessarily get the encryption key and unlock your data. Right. You may pay a lot of money. Um, but I, so let me give you another factor to consider. And it happened in my hometown of Atlanta. They've got hit with a ransomware attack. It was not publicly stated whether they paid the ransom, but they didn't. They didn't pay the ransom. They didn't get their data in encrypted. And in remediation cost alone, it was $17 million. That does not account for other, like the legal department lost all their legal research for year, decades of legal research. That's an intellectual property that you just can't value. Court time, customers were impaired. They couldn't access city services. So 17 million was the actual cost for the mitigation team, but there had to been probably quadruple that in actual losses of lost efficiency, et cetera. So should the city of Atlanta have paid whatever the ransom may have been, 50,000, 100,000? Well, that's a public decision, to public policy issue. Should they pay or not pay? They didn't, and look at the cost. So uh, that was the decision they made, but it's, it's, a, it's a question for governance. Shouldn't be the first time they're thinking about it. I wouldn't want to be in that position of having to make the decision. But I will say for some victims, it may make sense to pay the ransom. Yeah. And of course, paying the ransom isn't a guarantee that you're no. going to get the, the data, which is adding insult to injury. Exactly. That could definitely happen. Yeah. So on that happy note, <laughs> I want to just share with the audience that this isn't the first time Vic has joined the podcast. Um, he shared some additional insights on fraud protection in a session we called The Honest Truth About Fraud, which is, of course, um, what his book is called. You can watch it now. A link is in the show notes below and on YouTube. Links will appear momentarily. As always, we greatly appreciate your thumbs up, your comments, your shares, and your subscribes.